Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and in this video we pick up with Claiborne as the Atlanta campaign begins, when William Tecumseh Sherman marches south. On May 8, 1864, Claiborne rushed his men to the sound of battle at Doug Gap, west of Dalton, Georgia. A small band of infantry and cavalry were holding off an advancing Union column, but they needed assistance. Claiborne ordered forward Granbury and Lowry's brigade to the Gap. Granbury arrived first and deployed into battle. Hardy was with Claiborne, but at sundown, when the situation looked to be under control, Hardy left to report to Johnston. Claiborne and his men slept on the ground, Claiborne with only his saddle blanket to sleep on. The men had thrown off their knapsacks and blankets to make the march more quickly. The next day, Joseph E. Johnston's lack of effective cavalry reconnaissance made for a confusing day. The cavalry under Joseph Wheeler was to the north, fighting with Union cavalry and not informing the army commander of where Sherman was moving next. Claiborne was asked to ascertain whether the enemy in his front were even still there, or if they were, were they at full strength? Claiborne could not answer because that was the job for mobile cavalry units, not the slow-moving infantry he had. At midnight, Claiborne got word from Hardy and Johnston that Sherman may be moving further south to cut the rail line at Resaca. So he formed up his three brigades and marched five hours to Resaca. On the way there, the men reclaimed their knapsacks, but found that the contingent that they had relieved at Doug Gap had taken the food out of their knapsacks. Irritated and hungry, they made it to Resaca only to be ordered to countermarch back to Doug Gap. Another five hours of marching brought them right where they had started. General Hood had been sent to Resaca as well, and when he arrived, he thought the situation safe from Union threat. That is why Claiborne was ordered to return to Doug Gap. However, Hood was wrong, horribly wrong. When Hood discovered this, Claiborne and his whole division was ordered back to Resaca. On May 11th, at 7 a.m., Claiborne moved out. When he made it to the town, his men threw up breastworks and prepared for a fight. All he found was Federal cavalry, but that force was testing how far up the roads the Confederate infantry were. General McPherson's Union infantry were filing through Snake Creek Gap but he waited on Sherman to decide whether to move on Claiborne's men or not. Johnston, despite his lack of information about where the army was, concentrated not only his army of Tennessee west of Resaca, but now he had Leonidas Polk's army of Mississippi, bringing his total strength to about 60,000 men. However, Sherman still outnumbered him. Claiborne and his division occupied the direct center of the Confederate line. Sherman attacked the flanks and left the center for the most part alone. The Union commander had used those assaults to freeze the Confederate army in place while he maneuvered further south. Johnston, trying to halt Sherman's advance toward Atlanta, ordered a retreat. His men had defended their positions, but their supply line was being threatened. Once again, Claiborne was called upon to be the rear guard, and he held off pursuing the Federals until the Army of Tennessee made it south of Adairsville. Johnston divided his force when the road forked. Hardy's corps and Claiborne moved toward Kingston and Polk and Hood moved to Cassville. He hoped Sherman would divide his force too, and then he could use Polk and Hood to crush the half confronting them while Hardy defended his position. It worked. Sherman divided his force, but miscommunication ruined Johnston's plan, and the army again moved south. Over the course of two weeks, the army had withdrawn halfway to Atlanta, a significant city for the production of war materials. In the Alatoona Mountains, Johnston's army rested for a few days. Claiborne wrote letters to Sue Tarleton and received her letters to him. However, he would be saddened to discover while stationed there that his youngest half-brother, Christopher, who had joined John Hunt Morgan's command, had been killed in a battle at Dublin, Kentucky. Sherman was attempting another flanking maneuver, and Johnston was determined to stop it. At the engagement soon to be known as the Battle of Pickett's Mill, Claiborne's division was placed in reserve behind Thomas Heinemann's division on the far right of the Confederate line. Skirmishers began reporting more and more Federals massing on their right. Claiborne sent one brigade to extend Heinemann's line, but more reports came pouring in. Soon, Claiborne had repositioned his entire division, not behind Heinemann, but to his right, becoming the extreme right flank of the Confederate army. This was going to be one of the main attacks ordered by Sherman. If Claiborne hadn't perceived the threat to his right, the large Union assaulting columns, stacked multiple ranks deep, would have slammed into the exposed Confederate flank and possibly spelled disaster for Johnston's army. As the blue troops approached, General Granberry of Claiborne's division 
yelled for his men to fix bayonets. They did, and prepared for hand-to-hand -hand combat. For hours upon hours, Claiborne's men held against the Union onslaught. General Lowry's brigade, Claiborne's only reserve, were called into action by the Irishmen, who placed them on the extreme right as the Federals began to swing around again. Claiborne was reported to be extremely calm as the chaos of battle raged around him. Bullets whizzed by and artillery exploded in the air, but Claiborne never flinched. As sundown came, sporadic shooting remained. Granberry, who was asked by Claiborne to send out his skirmishers to see if the Federals were still close, asked permission to use his entire brigade. Claiborne agreed, and Granberry's men with fixed bayonets charged into the darkness, taking fire at point-blank range, but driving the Federals away from their position and taking 200 prisoners. As morning broke, one Confederate described the ground in front of his position as having a blue carpet spread out over it because of all the Union dead. The Federals claimed that they had lost about 1,600 men, although Claiborne estimated they lost around 3,000. Claiborne's division had only lost 85 killed and 363 wounded. Claiborne's division was gaining a reputation in the Army as being invincible. Over the next week, both armies stretched back to the main rail line that Johnston was trying to protect and Sherman was attempting to capture. Over that week, Claiborne fought a cold and diarrhea as constant skirmishing took place on his lines. The next week saw two casualties that impacted Claiborne. On June 14th, an artillery shell killed General Leonidas Polk. William Loring, the senior division commander in Polk's corps, took temporary command of the corps, but a week later, Alexander P. Stewart of Hood's Corps would take permanent command. Stewart's placement is curious, not because he wasn't a capable commander, but he was six months a junior to Claiborne as a major general, and he did not have the amazing record that Claiborne had. Additionally, Stewart was West Point trained, but it is believed by historians that Claiborne's suggestion of arming slaves held him back from getting that position. The day after his uncle was killed, Lucius Polk's position was hit with heavy artillery fire, and his horse was killed by a shell, which mangled his legs and ripped away a large section of his calf. Claiborne rushed to his close friend and asked how badly he was hurt. Polk knew how stingy Claiborne was with giving furloughs and replied, well, I think I'll be able to get a furlough now. It was a little bit of comedic relief amidst the horrors of war. Polk would have to resign from the army in July, not being able to perform adequate service because of his injury. Instead of appointing a new brigade commander, his brigade had been so depleted because of the constant battles that it was decided to disperse the regiments throughout the division. Johnston positioned his army on Kennesaw Mountain, and Claiborne prepared his men for an assault. Again, his men were going to be in the thickest of the fighting when George Thomas, under orders from Sherman, arrayed five brigades, one behind the other, with fixed bayonets, and charged Claiborne's position. The entrenched Confederates were not only protected by their dug-in position, but by Abatee and Chevaux de Frise. If the Union defenders could make their way across all those obstacles, then the leveled rifled muskets of Claiborne's division awaited them. For over four hours, Claiborne's division fought off the Union onslaught. On a few occasions, the blue troops made it to the Gray Lines, but were thrown back each time. Near the end of the fighting, muzzle flashes had ignited the dry underbrush, and the Union wounded were beginning to burn alive. The wounded called out for help, and when they did, Major William H. Martin of the 1st Arkansas tied a white handkerchief to a ramrod, stood on the ramparts of the trenches, and yelled to the Federal troops that this was butchery to cease fire until their wounded were drugged to safety. Over the next few moments, both Union and Confederate soldiers drug and carried as many of the wounded as possible to safety before they burned alive. Once the job had been completed, the two sides went back to fighting. The Battle of Kennesaw Mountain was an unquestionable Confederate victory. In front of Claiborne's division, those Federals lost about 300 killed and over 500 wounded. Claiborne's division lost only two killed and nine wounded. On July 19th, Claiborne received word from Hardy that Johnston was relieved and Hood would take his place. Hood, Stewart, and Hardy asked Johnston to stay in command until the fight for Atlanta had been decided, but Johnston said he was a soldier and he would obey orders. Hood's placement as Army commander was a slap in the face of Hardy who was the senior corps commander and who had been entrusted with the army before Johnston arrived to take command. Hood now needed to name a new corps commander. He didn't think his division commanders were capable of commanding a corps, so he approached Hardy and asked which one of his division commanders should be placed in that position. 
Hardy recommended Cheatham. This was strange, and we may never know why he chose Cheatham over Claiborne. Over the years, historians have postulated that Hardy didn't want to lose Claiborne as a division commander. Some have even suggested that since Claiborne took no initiative in councils of war or offered his own opinions, that he was unable to exercise that type of independent command. Hardy did place his headquarters near Claiborne. Was that because of friendship, or did he believe that Claiborne needed oversight? Many point to Claiborne's proposal to arm slaves as the reason that he was not given corps command. No matter the reason, Cheatham was chosen, and Claiborne would remain a division commander.